David, great to see you again. Thank you very much for spending some time. I'd like to give everyone a little update on what's happened in the six weeks since you were on the main stage at NFTMIC 2024. There's been enormous activity with BASE and uh, our friends at DAPA and Flow have some really interesting news. So why don't we start with BASE? Uh, Jesse Pollack was recently interviewed and he said there were three reasons why BASE was so successful. Number one was they were subsidizing uh, the, the gas price, so it's very inexpensive to do transactions on base. Uh, he also said that uh, developers are getting involved because they're seeing so many really interesting um, applications being developed by Coinbase themselves for uh, on the base layer, layer two blockchain. And of course they have enormous deal flow um, being an exchange. So we'll talk about that and then we'll also talk about uh, the upcoming release of Crescendo, which is a EVM version of Flow. So welcome back. Great to see you. Um, we're just going to do a little five minute update now. And then at the end of this, we're going to play your wonderful on stage um, talk at NFT NYC 2024. Welcome back. Great. Thank you, Jody. It's great to be back. I think um, some of the observations you're making, maybe we could put into a larger context. The larger context is that activity on blockchains is up and to the right. So if we look back to January of 2021 until now, we've had a 20x increase in blockchain activity since then. That's transactions, 20x. TL, 20x. 20x. So if you just wow. want to look at like, is there activity on blockchains? Yes, it's up and to the right. And what has significantly contributed to that is not just one thing. It's the combination of DeFi, stable coin volumes, which are up 8x in the same time period. Decentralized social activity is meaningfully up in the last few months, really since December. DPIN, these decentralized physical infrastructure networks are also up meaningfully. So it is, the co it is really a combination of many different developer activities and applications being built on blockchains that is increasing usage. And which blockchains are developers using? Well, you're pointing out developers like blockchains that have really fast execution time, really low fees, and compatibility right, with a lot of other applications. So we're seeing, no surprise, attraction to the layer twos like base, which for all the reasons you point out, uh, is fully compatible with the Ethereum ecosystem, but it's just a cheaper version really of Ethereum, right? meaningfully faster, meaningfully cheaper for a developer to deploy on rather than deploying on the core e Ethereum blockchain. And, and by the way, something like 90% now of all Ethereum transactions are actually starting on a layer two and then settling on, on the mid. So developers have migrated heavily uh, to, to, to layer twos and, and bases, depending on how you measure it, the number one or number two uh, layer two. So a uh, lot of developer activity, but we're seeing that not just across Ethereum, we're seeing that um, on Solana. Solana has really meaningfully increased activity across all the dimensions I just mentioned, stable coins and payments uh, and, and a lot of deep in activity. And we're seeing it in emerging blockchains too, like Flow. We'll talk about that in a second, but let me just pause there and see if that makes some sense. So uh, two things, um, it, you mentioned decentralized social um, applications. Um, give me an example of one. That's super interesting because we've not seen that before, really, have we? Yeah, the biggest one is actually uh, one called Kai Ching, which is a decentralized shopping app built on chain that gives you rewards for shopping. Um, mm -hmm. And it's social because you can see other people's shopping activity around it. Um, that is dominating total de decentralized social activity. But we're now seeing things like Farcaster and um, in the Warpcast app, the Farcaster ecosystem, um, emergent social activity that's now also increasing usage. It's not massive. You know, it's like uh, 50, 100,000 incremental users there and 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 many hundreds of thousands in um, in Kaiching, but it's one of the contributing factors to blockchain's increased usage. And and the shopping app that you mentioned, I, I don't think I could pronounce it as well as you. Can you I tell Ching. everyone again? A-A-I-C-H-I-N-G. And, and why has blockchain added any value to, we've had shopping apps for a long time. What's the value that blockchain has Yeah, because added? the rewards you own, you know, I mean, the, right. the problem with loyalty points are that you, you can only use them in the closed ecosystem at the airline or 
the coffee company yep. lets you use them. But rewards built on chain can be, you own them. You can do anything you want, they resell them. And and then other people can build on top and interoperate with the, with that reward system. That's interesting. Our sister company, NFT Credit, is working on a project with an airline who is using NFTs for rewards. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the second thing that you mentioned was base. Um, and I've just remembered that that wonderful slide that you showed us on stage at NFT NYC 2024 of the top 10 um, layer twos didn't even include base. Aren't, are you staggered that in such a short time base has sort of risen up? I think um, I was probably counting all layer two activity in Ethereum and looking at that as the right. ecosystem. Um, yeah. If you break the layer twos out and treat them as individual blockchains against other ones. You'll see lots of activity on base and um, and Arbitrum and you know some other layer twos. Um, there are a bunch of uh, zk based ones like zk sync, which also has really meaningful uh, total transaction volume. So like I don't want to get too in the weeds here because th what what we're seeing the statement here is the blockchains are infrastructure for developers to build new applications on that give properties to those apps that you can't achieve in Web2. gives ownership and sovereignty of data and interoperability, composability, all these things you can't do in Web2. And, uh, and, and not this concentration of power that we have in the giant internet giants. And so the question is like, does anyone care? Do developers care? And the answer is yes, because they're producing enough applications that are increasing usage 20X in three years. Um, and that's across a number of different apps. And developers are are choosing different infrastructure to deploy their apps depending on what they they want for their applications. You know, we we don't have a lot of conversations now about like that new app, that new website you tried, is that hosted on AWS or on Google? Like no one cares. It's just infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And and hopefully I think mm -hmm. that we reach that point in in blockchains where you don't care what what chain it's built on. The developers care because it enables certain types of properties. Um, but but still I, I view this largely as an infrastructure conversation. That is such an interesting point about no one really cares whether it's AWS or Google. Um, you and I are old enough to remember the 90s where there was a sort of a big argument about as a developer, do you develop in Mac OS? Do you develop on, what was it? Remember CPM, that operating system? Yeah, sure. I remember CPM. that. Yeah. And, OS2 um, and Windows. And OS, yeah, exactly. And, um, they were all centralized. And I think you, in previous years, you and I have spoken about whether we'll end up with just three or four blockchains, but it's not, it's not turning out like that, is it? There's such a selection for developers and each blockchain has its own nuance. And so we're, we're in a unique period in tech where there is no single dominant player, but many. And that perhaps leads me into I know you're an investor and an advisor um, and on the board of Dapper, you, you were very, very early on in realizing that they would be successful. They've just come out with some very interesting news that they are, they are maintaining all of the great benefits that particularly for brands uh, for the flow blockchain and are also EVM compatible. That's an extraordinary story. Um, can yeah, you, so can you Flow is, a, is also one of these highly performant blockchains. It's meant for developers who produce consumer applications where they need really low latency and high performance, typically among users connecting to each other, like in a game. So it's not just yes. an application has to perform quickly, but user to user interaction has to be really, really fast. And, uh, and in addition, the, the costs of operating on the chain have to be low. You just pointed out that Jesse said when layer two subsidize Ethereum gas fees, they get more developers on it because the cost per transaction is lower. Well, Solana and Flow have really low per transaction costs, effectively gas fees. Um, but what's what the risk of being a developer and, and ad adopting a non-Ethereum chain is that you could give up compatibility with the wider Ethereum ecosystem. And so Flow is doing something to solve for that by making an EVM compatibility release. It's already been announced and you can read all about it in Flow's developer docs, but you'll be able to take um, smart contracts, applications for Web3 that have been written in Solidity and you'll be able to deploy them very easily on top of Flow and also take advantage of the Flow benefits that you don't get 
in traditional Ethereum maps, like account abstraction, which makes it super easy for customers to onboard into a wallet and not have to worry mm. about those, you know, crazy 12 word phrases and things like that. Um, and a bunch of other cool benefits too. So I think this is pretty meaningful. One other reason why I think Flow is an interesting blockchain to watch is that their development environment, which is called Cadence, is heralded by developers who try it. They love it. They would love to write in Cadence and not in Solidity. Take does a lot of work for you. It's more elegant, modern language. Um, uh, but you know, if the only place you can use those apps is on Flow, and Flow is not as big and bilaterally compatible with Ethereum, it can be a, a challenge. So this is what I think this, this new um, crescendo release solves. Well, it's great to chat with you again. Um, I always look forward to our conversations. Um, you are amazing. You are so articulate in the way you can describe to NFT NYC, the attendees and, and the ecosystem, uh, exactly what's going on. So it's, it's a joy to see you again, David. Thank you very much. You too, Jody. Always great to talk to you and thanks for reaching out. And I hope everyone likes my talk. Thank you so much, Jody Cameron. Good morning, NFT NYC. Awesome to see you. I can't believe that uh, that Jody and Cameron and Ian and the entire team do such a good job of bringing us all together year after year, seven years. That's nuts. I hope I make it to the 17th. I'm sure it'll, it'll keep going. As Jody mentioned, my job is to share with you a, a perspective about where we are, what's happened in the last year in the world of NFTs. Where are things in the cycle and what's working and what's not? I am an optimist. I am a super believer in the innovation behind NFTs and what can be accomplished and created as a result of them. So you're gonna hear a very positive spin, but the data is not fantastic and I'm a realist. So I'll share with you what I think's happened and where we are and I will then share with you where I think we're going. So let's get into the state of NFTs. First, of course, some data. Let's take a look at weekly sales volume over the last two years of NFTs. This is in dollars. And you can see things are down. They're down from the peak of early 2022. Um, and, but we've had a little bit of increase in activity since November of last year. The colors on the bars tell you where NFT buying and selling activity is happening, which marketplaces. And you see a pretty meaningful share shift over the last year from OpenSea to Blur. We'll talk about why that's happening. If we take a look at the number of actual people or wallets that are doing the buying and selling, that number's down too. If we look at uh, actually going back to the end of 21, we had uh, many millions of individuals buying or selling NFTs. It looks like we came close to 10 million. And then just a year ago, or just, a, just under two years ago, we were maybe at half a million several hundreds of thousands. And now we're really probably 50, 60, 70,000 total people buying and selling NFTs. This probably undercounts a little bit, but it's still directionally close. And what that really means is that NFTs right now have become largely a market of almost mercenary traders, people who are professionally trading NFTs to make money. And that helps explain why the share shift happened from OpenSea to Blur because Blur is a marketplace with whose tools and interface is really geared towards people who are trading for value and investment and less about an amateur normie collecting. Where are NFT sales happening on which blockchains? Well, Ethereum, this is just the last 30 days. We're selling a, a little bit more than a billion a month. It's not a small number, 12 billion or more a year, but it's not the 40 or 50 billion that we saw in, its, in the years of 21 and 22. But the surprising piece of data here is that one, sales continue to happen across multiple chains. Solana has held a number three position, but the surprise is Bitcoin, which with the invention of ordinals, sort of an extension set to Bitcoin, Bitcoin now allows for the purchase of NFT-like um, products on top of it. And we've seen incredible activity around ordinals over the last year. Now, those of you who are familiar with the world of crypto would say, well, you denominated in those charts NFT sales volume by dollars. And since crypto prices are up, won't dollar denominated NFT values be up too? And of course, the answer to that is yes. Crypto prices are up 150, 200% in a bunch of cases. 
And so ETH denominated NFTs and Bitcoin denominated NFTs when they're priced in dollars are gonna show an increase. And actually, that's exactly what we expect to happen. As prices go up, of course, USD volume of NFTs increase, but also activity increases because people who buy NFTs tend to be already familiar with crypto. And if your crypto bags are increasing in value, you've got more effective wealth to spend on NFTs. And so we expect an in increase in NFT volumes, usually on the order of a month or two after price increases in crypto. And that's what's been happening. So what are some signs of life? What's super exciting in the world of NFTs? And where should we look for evidence that we're coming out of the doldrums? Well, one, of course, as Jody already mentioned, is Pudgy Penguins. This is a fantastic NFT collection of 8,888 roughly profile pictures, and they've traded on Ethereum, and you can see they've enjoyed some tremendous value appreciation. Uh, the the um, Pudgies are held by about 4,700 people, so the average holder holds two, and they have the highest floor price where they compete, uh, changes every day, but very close to the highest floor price. It costs about $40,000 to buy a Pudgy NFT, and the entire collection is worth above $350 million. It's a fantastic story. But what makes it so interesting is not just that its prices go up, but that there's a real world physical tie-in. And that's that there's also a plush toy, a real world physical plush toy associated with this collection that you can buy at Walmarts. We started with a few hundred, but they sold a few hundred locations, but they sold a bunch and Walmart was pretty mercenary about what they carry in their stores. Things have to sell <laughs> for them to carry it increased the footprint to 3,100 stores. They've sold more than $10 million of Pudgy, Pudgy Penguin plush toys. And when you buy one, there's a QR code, you scan it, and you get some NFTs uh, that you can use in a, for, in a sort of the online Pudgy world. You don't get one of the $40,000 NFTs, but you do get welcomed into the family. So a really interesting experiment, and this is being sold certainly to normies, not to hardcore NFT traders. What else is exciting? Well. Royalties are back. We went through a terrible period a year, year and a half ago. Jody called me in despair that there was this race to the bottom as marketplaces were eschewing the chance to pay royalties on secondary sales of NFTs to the creators. This was a terribly short-sighted, sort of mercenary type decision by some marketplaces that just shoots the entire industry in the foot. And I'm glad to see that we're coming out of that period and that royalties are being embraced again by marketplaces. And I think, of course, we will restore some normality. Creators, main one of the many important reasons to create an NFTs is that you enjoy uh, economic success on um, primary sales, but also on secondary sales as well. What else is exciting? What else will lead us out of, uh, of the NFT depths? Uh, well, one, of course, is mobile. M more than 90% of all internet activity in the connected world is happening on mobile devices. But mobile has been an unfriendly place for crypto for a long time, and NFTs are no exception. It's starting to change. NBA Top Shot by Dapper Labs uh, released a new version of the NBA Top Shot mobile app, and, in, and as you can download it in the App Store and the Google Play Store. And in that product, there is now a new game called Fast Break, where you take some of your existing NBA Top Shot NFTs, and on a daily tournament, get to drop them in, take five players and drop them in to Fast Break. And it's sort of like a fantasy game, where that night, as all the games are played, the points leaders are added up, and uh, something like the top 100 or top 1,000 um, players get enrolled in a chance to win a very rare pack. And this has had a nice effect on NBA Top Shot sales, which just in the last 30 days are up meaningfully. What does that tell us? When you make NFT experiences really convenient on the devices that people use, like mobile, you can increase sales and increase engagement. What else is exciting? Well, games. This season, this year, we're gonna see hundreds of games released that use NFTs inside of them as the mechanism for in-game items purchase. Many of them are not gonna call them NFTs. They're not gonna use the words crypto or blockchain or wallets, but they're gonna make it so you actually own the items that you buy. This is a game from a studio called Gunzilla, and the game's called Off the Grid. It's in alpha now. It's shipping, uh, I think, uh, this quarter. It's built on top of um, a, the Guns blockchain, which is an Avalanche subnet. It's very fast, allows for some customization. 
but this is a triple A um, cyberpunk battle royale game made by a fantastic game studio, and they allow for some incredible in-game item customization. More than 200 items are available for sale or purchase, and it's things like armor and exoskeletons and weapons. But as, you're, as you improve those items and they increase in value, you remain the owner of them. You can take them and sell them anywhere you want. Um, and I think we're gonna see a lot of this this year that could lead to more normy NFT behavior. What else? Well, the last topic I wanted to bring up with you is a topic that has uh, uh, completely taken over the entire tech industry and maybe even some of society as well, and that's AI. Why, what does NFTs have to do with AI? Well, many of you are thinking generative art, and since NFTs are a place for creators, that's what we're talking about. And, and we should talk about that, but I wanted to address one last topic on this point. The, the exciting thing we're seeing in generative AI are from the large language models that train on the words, pictures, videos, and music that we as creators make. Those, those LLMs from OpenAI and Microsoft and, and Google and, and soon Facebook and Apple and Amazon have uh, searched the entire internet and read and consumed everything they can. And the problem with that is it really, it's really great for those models, but none of us received any compensation for the use of our works. We didn't receive any shares in OpenAI. Did anyone get any shares in OpenAI? When uh, they scanned your website or your images? We didn't receive any payment. We're not sharing in any revenue that these companies are generating. So what, what's needed is a repository of content on which these models can train with our permission. And the perfect system for doing that is NFTs and blockchain. All content can just be minted as an NFT, so we know who owns it. We can put it into open tra training sets that uh, models can train on, provided they pay to use it, and some mechanism for payment sharing can happen over blockchains. So if the New York Times lawsuit against OpenAI proves to be to, uh, that the content owners must be paid or their permission must be sought, there are a bunch of startups working on bringing NFTs and crypto to the problem of how you track all that. So with that as a little touch on for the day, I hope you guys have a great NFT NYC. I'm honored to be a part of it, and I hope to see you and talk to you all. Thank you. Always my favorite. Um, you spoke a little bit about brands and what they were doing. Um, what really interests me is you know, how do we get the brands a little more into the space? They've been very cautious. Um, there's been some great execution. There's been some not so great execution. And, and, and what do we say to the brands out there um, so that this time next year you can talk about some more brand use cases? Well, I think we would expect to see a lot of the smaller companies and innovators pave the way. But there are some brands that are all in, mm -hmm. sports brands, you know, NBA and NFL are all over this because loyalty is so important in sports. Just like we see Starbucks backing down and saying, I'm not gonna do NFTs anymore, the announcement that came yesterday, um, we see sports brands leaning in. Mm. So my guess is, and then we have, we have Walmart and Pudgy as a, you know, an example of what can work in the real world. So my guess is that if we, if we have um, more proven examples that this is safe, consumers like it, they don't feel like they're getting ripped off, prices don't fall, <laughs> right, mm. these sort of crashes, then I think it, it makes it easier for the l bigger brands to come in. But, but usually, the ones that are willing to take on the leading edge early on, if they're thoughtful and they partner with people like this in this room, mm. can be rewarded and differentiated. And when you talk about loyalty in sports, what does that look like? Is it um, NFTs that capture a moment? Is it NFTs that provide a benefit to a fan? I, I know that um, uh, we heard from the CEO of Live Nation. He, he was very, very all in with NFTs, still is. But w what do you think loyalty looks like in the NFT space? I think sports are uh, one of the most loyalty-based, uh, high repeat activities. Most sports industries aren't growing significantly. They're not like adding tons of new fans every year. Mm. Um, they, they look for young people to come into a sport um, you know, as a fan. But uh, so really most sports marketing by major leagues around the world is about repeat engagement. Mm. Keep watching the next game, keep wearing the merchandise, 
And maybe one way to accomplish that is to do a better job rewarding for that loyalty, which we don't do a lot of in sports today. Um, it, to t the television product of sports is really good. It's good mm. to watch sports on mm. TV. They'd love you to come to some games too. How do we increase that? Well, maybe a more, more loyalty programs are part of that. And NFTs are like the perfect mechanism, right, for loyalty, reward. So um, I, I hear great thought coming from the leagues like the NBA. And, and the way they distribute the NFTs is important. In sports, you can distribute it with a ticket. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, I was talking to someone earlier today about, you know, what did Starbucks not do so well? And, and I was told that the NFT was just on their website. It wasn't in store. It wasn't on social. It wasn't delivered properly through normal channels. Um, so I think... My job here is to make sure that we really amplify the great use cases and maybe also pick apart the ones that haven't worked so well. Totally, you do a great job of doing that. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna be searching over the next few days and talking with uh, some of the best creators in the world, the number of artists you've assembled here, creators you've assembled here, who love this mechanism to distribute their work and to get paid for their work and to reach new audiences. Uh, they're the ones who are gonna blaze the trail, right? We're, we wanna watch them and see what works. Just tell the audience, David, how many NFT companies have you funded over the last few years? Uh, well, we, we've invested in, I think, six different companies having something to do with NFTs, whether it's a marketplace or um, a studio uh, or a game that's using them or a protocol that helps with valuation. Mm. And, and now uh, we're investing in a bunch of stuff at the intersection of AI and crypto, which, as I mentioned, I think really impacts and can utilize NFTs. So probably on the order of seven or eight companies. Oh, amazing, thank you. Hopefully to do more. Yeah, and, and you talked about marketplaces. Um, there's been sort of this really interesting trend in marketplaces where we've had marketplaces that are sort of general purpose marketplaces and royalties has been an issue and I'm about to talk to Alex Atala about that. And then there's been marketplaces that um, are curated, they have curated things where peop many people have felt that there's a gate and they haven't been able to get in. Um, and I believe that the next stage with marketplaces is for marketplaces to be very brand specific. And if we each have our own brand, we can actually drive traffic to our own branded marketplaces. What do you think about that? So I was gonna ask you that same question because I, I think that is the most logical way for marketplaces to exist mm -hmm. is as a, a you know, part of the brand experience. Mm -hmm. the, the place to, like when you go to the New York Yankees website, you can buy New York Yankees merchandise right on the New York Yankees website, right? You don't have to go to eBay to buy that merchandise. Um, you can sell your stuff on eBay, yeah. but uh, same thing for tickets, right? So I would expect that for primary and secondary sales around major brands, they're gonna run their own marketplaces. Yeah. And many of the marketplaces <coughs> in this room might help curate those experiences, or might help create those experiences for them, mm -hmm. right? And we've seen something about that. What do you think the major brands should be doing or thinking about? Well, if I was a major brand, I would certainly be sending the traffic that I generate through all of my other activities to my own NFT branded marketplace. But what particularly interests me is you know, how, does it, how does a little person, how does an artist that's perhaps not so well known generate traffic to their own space? And I think they can use NFTs to do it. They can be postcards, they can be flyers, they can be tickets, they can be redemption offers, you know, meet the artist. Um, a little bit the way so many people use Shopify. Like that's, that's their own storefront. And I think that's where it's going. And I hope this time next year we'll be able to show you hundreds and hundreds of examples from big brands to little brands, and you'll include that in your State of the Nation. State of the Nation talk. Can't wait for next year. <laughs> Thank you well, very I'm gonna much. I'm going to go enjoy this year. Thank you for all you do, Jody. No, that's a pleasure. Thanks, everybody.